if you think dogs are trying to tell us something with all of their howling and singing, you're right. And we're going to dive into why dogs have great musical tastes, but should never be allowed to sing in choir. Welcome to The Singing Hole, where we examine how ordinary creatures create extraordinary sounds. Today, we're examining canines and why some dogs seem to sing, perhaps better than some humans. If you'd like to jump ahead to the vocal analysis section, you can click the bookmark below. Otherwise, let's start with some history and pop culture about man's best friend. My eyes were wet with tears, our little dog, when I bore thee to the grave. So, Patricus, never again shall thou give me a thousand kisses, never canst thou be contentedly in my lap. Ah me, what a loved companion we have lost. This partial quote can be found inscribed on a grand marble tomb, built and lovingly dedicated to Patricus, an adored pet of an ancient Roman family. The abundance of dog tombs found around the world proves that the love we feel for canines is limited by no chronological or cultural bounds. Dog memorials of varying age have been unearthed in Siberia, China, Mesoamerica, Africa, and beyond. According to architectural evidence, dogs were the first animals to be domesticated by humans more than 30,000 years ago. That's 10,000 years or so before man domesticated horses. Ancient Greeks and Romans believed it was essential for every family to have a dog. Zeus was guarded as an infant by a magical golden dog named Lelaps, who was destined to always catch his quarry. In the Odyssey, Odysseus wept tears of joy when his aged dog Argus recognized him after returning from his circuitous and perilous journey. The gates to the underworld, Hades, were guarded by a three-headed dog, Cerberus. If the name Cerberus sounds familiar to you beyond Greek mythology, it may be that you've seen a more modern portrayal of this famous guard dog. A Cerberus has been featured in everything from Dante's Inferno, written in 1911, to Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, to Disney's Hercules and Hades, the award-winning roguelike video game with stupid awesome music by Darren Korb. During the time of Homer, dogs also guarded the house and were lauded as pets and even used as warriors in battle. Imagine swords and explosions and later guns and through it all, a bounding, trusty and capable canine. Sergeant Stubby was an actual sergeant in World War I who served in 17 battles. He saved his regiment from surprise mustard gas attacks, sought out wounded soldiers, and even cornered and retained enemy soldiers. Sergeant Stubby is one example of many hero war dogs, all of whom were publicly celebrated. Chips was the most decorated war dog in World War II. Nemo and Kaiser both served in the Vietnam War, and Smokey, the World War II war dog, has been lauded as the first ever therapy dog. Dogs have also been used by law enforcement agencies for well over 100 years. Bloodhounds were first used in England in 1888 to help search for the notorious serial killer, Jack the Ripper. Just a year later, police stations began formally training dogs for police work. With such heroic acts, it's not surprising that dogs have been featured in countless publications, paintings, and films. There's All Dogs Must Go to Heaven, the 1989 film featuring the voices of Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds. Where the Red Fern Grows, the 1961 book by Wilson Rawls. Brian, the Family Guy, Wes Anderson's film Isle of Dogs, or Wallace and Gromit. There are quite literally too many references to list. So what sustains this fixation on our relationships with man's best friend? That phrase, by the way, is credited to Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, referring to one of his Italian greyhounds. Dogs are arguably the most relatable and accessible mammals to which humans can form relationships. Domesticated dogs are communicative in many ways that humans communicate with one another. Dogs use body language, facial expressions, and vocalizations to communicate with mankind. And a plethora of vocalizations at that. 
It's no wonder they've captured our hearts through the centuries. Before we dive into how dogs communicate with their human counterparts, let's talk about how they communicate with each other. We're all familiar with the powerful sound of pack howling in chorus. If not from personal experience, then certainly from film. Wild wolves howl to communicate their location to other pack members and to ward off rivaling packs from their territory. Wolves will howl to their own pack members out of affection. African dogs have even been theorized to communicate through sneezes. Research at the University of South Wales, Sydney, and Taronga Conservation Society, Australia, has confirmed that these dogs, like Hayon Pictus, gather in social rallies where they use sneezes as a kind of voting system. Researchers consistently observed that the more sneezes emitted, the more likely it was that a specific pack would move off and begin hunting. Wow. Domesticated dogs have developed communication methods in concert with their bipedal family members. Anyone who has lived with dogs most likely knows exactly when their pet wants to play, eat, go for a walk. Just like we know when they don't want to take a B-A-T-H or go to the V-E-T. Even nonverbal communication has been honed to mirror our own. Human expressions of joy, fear, excitement, or love. Of course, some dog owners have delved deeper into cultivating a more complex form of communication with their furry co-inhabitants. Bunny the dog, featured on social media platforms as What About Bunny, is an internet famous sheepadoodle. That's a mix of an old English sheepdog and a standard poodle, whose owner entrusted her dog's speech development to a speech pathologist studying assistive technology in particular, alternative and augmentative communication devices to help nonverbal children acquire vocabulary and communicate without speaking. Before see cat and bye. That's right, it's because the cat is upstairs now. Using their collective research, experience, expertise, and technology, Bunny was gifted with an array of vocabulary buttons on a soundboard. Using these buttons, Bunny can communicate her desires, fears, and questions to her family. Her understanding and use of vocabulary has been impressive. Bunny talks about her observations, her dreams, her love for her family, her paw injury, and once she even reminded her mom to give her brother, a poodle named Otter, his medication as mom had forgotten to earlier in the day. But of course, this channel is called The Singing Hole. Thanks to the glory of the internet, the ultimate dog expression has been revealed. Dogs can sing. In concert, duet, or glorious solo, dogs can really belt it out with the best of them. And while we've known dogs can howl, it's very surprising that they can howl in tune, or at least they can attempt to do so. Going back to 1955, a barking medley of Pat a Cake, Three Blind Mice, and Jingle Bells was recorded by RCA Records. The record The Singing Dogs became a hit, reaching number 22 on the US Pop Billboard singles chart. The record eventually sold over a million copies. In 1971, Jingle Bells was reissued as a single, hitting number one on the Billboard Christmas Singles Chart in 1972. Since the 50s, dogs seem to have sharpened their skills. Now dogs can even yodel. The Basenji, or African barkless dog, emits an adorable howling yodel. Pam and her three-year-old golden retriever, Oscar, debuted their act on America's Got Talent in 2018. Check out Oscar's golden pipes as he attempts to harmonize with his mom on the piano as she plays Canon in D by Pachelbel. Tank, the American pit bull terrier, became a sensation on YouTube when his owner captured his reaction to his favorite country tune, Tennessee Whiskey by Chris Stapleton. (laughs) 
I wonder if Elizabeth will make a revised reaction and analysis video to this version. It really is easy to lose track of time going down the dog singing rabbit hole on social media. On stage, at home, or riding in cars, no matter the venue, dogs just love expressing their vocal talent with or without an accompaniment. But why exactly do they sing? It turns out there are several reasons why. And the type of howling cause can mean different things. It can mean that your dog is trying to warn you of danger or that your dog is lonely. A lot of howling patterns can be traced back to dogs' ancestors, wolves, who use howling to establish pack identity, territory, and location. Sometimes wolves also howl as a social activity because they just seem to enjoy howling together, like humans singing in a choir. It's even called a chorus howl. But there's one big difference. When humans sing together, we tend to either join together on the same pitch or blend in harmony. We like sounding good together. Wolves, on the other hand, like sounding bad together. No wolf seems to want to be on the same pitch. While this howling behavior is establishing pack identity, it's also establishing individuality within the pack. When another wolf joins in, recordings show that sometimes they'll change their pitch to avoid another wolf's voice. This creates a cluster of discordant pitches together. When you hear that music composition, it's often associated with horror films because pitch clusters can give us the heebie-jeebies. But hey, maybe canines like horror films. After all, they've got music preferences. That's right, dogs actually have taste in music. I don't know if it's good taste, but after reading one particular study that tested a range of music from metal to classical out in a kennel, I'm tempted to say that dogs do have decent musical tastes. One dog, famous for his musical taste, aided legendary ring cycle composer Richard Wagner in writing music. Wagner watched his dog as he composed and modified the music according to the dog's reactions. I've heard some pretty strong opinions about Wagner's music, so I'll let you decide whether or not this worked. There are numerous studies documenting the influence of music on dogs. Classical music seems to have a calming effect. Heavy rock and metal seem to elicit barking and agitation. And being that I'm a dog lover, I would tend to agree with that. Oftentimes when I'm writing, um, my dog will let me know that uh, enough's enough and go in the other room. I even had a dog a few years ago. Sigmund was his name. Awesome little shih tzu. And he would sing along with me. And if I was writing something that was more of an acoustic ballad, he would sing. If I was writing something that was pretty aggressive, he would sing. So I never really knew if he was agitated or if he just enjoyed singing along with me. Regardless, it was always fun. I miss that little guy. One paper summarizing nine studies on canine reaction to music suggests that veterinary clinics consider using music to help as therapy for animals. It may include beneficial effects on the immune system and metabolism beyond behavioral shifts. And check this out. It also suggests that playing classical music in animal shelters could help improve adoption rates. One thing that is almost guaranteed to get a loud reaction out of dogs is a siren. A study in 2020 examined sirens and wolf howls and found the two shockingly similar. The study examined aposmatism, or warning signaling, which indicates danger or a predator, and how a siren has similar acoustic characteristics to the warning howl of a wolf. In our not too distant past, wolves represented a major threat to mankind. The study suggests that we may have demonstrated a predisposition when creating an alerting siren that is perceptibly similar to a predator's call. Such a sound would be crucial to attune to for human survival. In creating that sound, we essentially have mimicked a call that would also have stirred the ancestors of our house pets. So it isn't surprising that dogs want to howl back. They likely think another animal from the pack is trying to communicate with them. That communication could just be saying, rough. I'm over here, Spot. Or it could be saying, grr, stay away from my family, Clifford. Take this one step further to music, or especially opera, and you'll remember the countless stories of dogs that start to sing along with music, especially high notes. Dogs hear higher than humans. A normal human hears best in the range between two to five kilohertz, whereas dogs hear easily up to 100 kilohertz. High notes, especially high notes in opera, produce very high overtones. 
similar to those in an opera, and this could trigger a response. And it may even be our canine friends identifying us as one of their pack. Whatever it is, they're definitely communicating with us. A study titled The Vocal Communication of Canines summarizes different dog vocalizations in this fantastic table, which includes barks, howls, growls, whines, yelps, snores, groans, and grunts. A list which sounds remarkably similar to a death metal vocalist describing their vocalization possibilities. The next table lists behavioral context for each sound. It's well documented that different sounds mean different things. Our dogs really are trying to talk to us. And as more research and science develops, we may be able to one day, soon I hope, talk back to them in a doggo language. It's even suggested that we may be able to use computer learning to help us better analyze and understand our canine friends. Dog chat GPT, anyone? Luckily, we have quite a bit in common with dogs at a laryngeal level, which may make this conversation more naturally possible. At the laryngeal level, dogs and humans are strangely alike. One study comparing an excised human larynx with other species found that a canine larynx and human larynx oscillate similarly but the amount of air pressure to create a pitch was ultimately different. Specifically, canine larynxes oscillate at frequencies similar to a human male. The fundamental frequency of the two, when compared, is almost exactly the same. 151 hertz for a human and 152 hertz for a dog. Another study showed a different, remarkable similarity between humans, dogs, and goats showing that dogs too can lower their larynx out of their nasopharynx, meaning that their voice box is essentially lowered away from their nose, which allows for a greater range of sounds. Check out this figure showing a dog going through the motion of a loud bark. Notice how the head tilts up as the sound is initiated. This allows the larynx to descend more. The soft palate also closes, which means the sound will exit through the mouth and likely will have better sound propagation and a more expansive dynamic. This study particularly noticed that laryngeal lowering and closure of the soft palate was especially present for loud sounds like howling. With these kinds of similarities, it's not surprising that canine larynxes are sometimes used to model various functionalities of a human larynx. Plus, both canine vocal folds and human vocal folds also show similar signs of aging and hoarseness. It's almost like we were meant to grow old together. So next time your dog or your neighbor's dog starts singing in the middle of the night or while the baby's asleep, instead of yelling at them, try singing along. We're more alike than you previously knew.